The JonBenet Ramsey case, I bet that was quite an experience. Well, I have never seen a case with that kind of media attention. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, though, all I did was the grand jury part of it. And all I was supposed to do was the DNA. And Bill Ritter came to me and said, Mitch, I need you to go up to Boulder and help Mike Kane out with this grand jury. And I said, Mike, I said, Bill, no, I'm not doing it. And he said, well, okay. Um, I said, well, what would you want me to do? And he said, well, you have to do the DNA. Mike doesn't understand it. Bruce Levin was being brought in also, and he didn't understand it. And it became very apparent to me that the Boulder DA's office didn't understand DNA based on when I got involved in it. And so it was like, there is no DNA. That's how early on it was. And he said, well, yeah, that's why it's perfect. Just go up there. And yeah. I had just finished a death penalty case. We did not get the death penalty. Where within a month of the John Bonet Ramsey case, a little African-American girl named Ashley Gray had been murdered down on five points. A man had taken her out of her house. She was with another little girl, John Bonet's age. He took these two little girls out the back while the father was out on the porch smoking crack cocaine and he kidnapped these girls. The brother of the other girl got him away. And then he took Ashley down to a loading dock near Coors Field and he brutally raped her, strangled her to death and threw her in a dumpster. And she was found in the dumpster the next day. He went home to his girlfriend's house handed him her his jeans and said, wash these. And she did. We found Ashley's blood on his pant leg. He was in custody within a day or so. And we tried him and we sought the death penalty on him. Jury convicted him of felony murder, sexual assault, and not deliberate murder, even though he strangled this little girl to death. And that ended our ability to go forward on the death penalty. But I spent two years working on that case every day, 12 hours a day. I would leave my house at about six in the morning. My kids would be asleep. I'd come home at eight, 10 o'clock at night. Wow. My kids would be asleep. Mm. It was the longest trial I ever had. And I never saw my kids awake for two years. So oh, I'm getting horrible. asked to do this Ramsey case. You're probably thinking, here we go yeah. again. Here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah. worth it? Yeah. And do, does my wife let me do this? Do my kids deserve this kind of thing? And so I said, no. And, I, you know, I love Bill Ritter. He's a great guy. He was a great boss. I tried murder cases with him when we worked for Norm Early together. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a great guy to try cases with. Some people don't like him because they don't like the way he was the governor of Colorado. Colorado, I don't care about that stuff. He's a great guy. But I told him no. It was the only thing I ever told him no about. Uh, but then Mike Kane, he knocks on my front door and I'm watching my two kids and he, he says, Mitch, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, Mike. And Mike had been my first chief deputy when I started in the DA's office. And Mike is every bit as compelling as Ritter. And Mike is, again, one of my favorite people. I talk to him every now and then. Uh, he lives in Philadelphia. He lives in Pennsylvania. He said, Mitch, I need you to do this for me. Uh, I don't understand it. It's part of this case. You need to come up and help me with this. I said, okay, on one condition, I never have to talk to the media about it. I never have to talk to anybody about it. And he said, absolutely. Alex Hunter will do that. We won't talk to the media. You know, you don't have to do any of that. So I went and got all my hair cut off and got a pair of sunglasses. They were starting like, you know, the next week. Wow. So it would but, really. Yeah. So I changed there. the way I looked. <laughs> got <laughs> sunglasses. Cognito. Yep. And I'll never forget the first day I was on the job. I had to get something out of the trunk of my car. It's completely surrounded by cameras, people yelling oh things God. at me. And I'm just walking. You know, and my hair is about, you know, I got it. Like a buzz cut? Buzz <laughs> yeah. off. And uh, now it didn't matter. They still knew who we were and who I was. And there was a guy that sat on a hill just outside the sidewalk that I would walk in every day with his camera. And I don't think he ever got anything worth showing, but he sat there. Sometimes he'd have four or five inches of snow on his head. Sometimes he would be sitting in this 80 degree sun and I would say good morning to him. How's it going? But other than that, I stayed clear of the media on that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm brought in to do the DNA, but there's really no DNA. So the first day I go up to the Colorado Bureau of Investigations 
to talk to the DNA analyst. And um, about halfway through the conversation, she knows me from working in the Denver crime lab. And she says, and she knows if she says certain things to me, it's going to mean something. And what she said was, her name was Kathy Dressel, and she had this high voice. She said, well, Mitch, what about that other stain in her panty? And I said, Kathy, I haven't been on this case long enough to read it. What are you talking about? And she said, well, there's another stain in her panties. I've tested the one, and it did have a mixture, but it didn't have much of a mixture. There's a couple markers in there. And I said, it's a separate stain. And she said, yes. And I said, is it big enough? What's how big is it? She showed me how big it was about the size of a dime. I said, cut it in half and test it, Kathy. And that is the stain that then had the male DNA in it. Mm. That was almost a full profile. So it had John Bonet Ramsey's DNA, right? Probably her blood. And it had male DNA. It was not sperm because you can mm-hmm. tell sperm male. You can tell DNA that isn't sperm, saliva, blood, hair based on the Y chromosome test. So that was done and it was male. And so I spent the rest of the 18 months and months after that and years after that trying to figure out whose DNA this is. Because remember, it's in this little girl's panties. Right. Crucial. Yeah, it is an intimate, what we call an intimate sample. Mm. It, you know, in a rape kit, when you do a rape examination, you take evidence out of, off the victim's body and from inside the victim's body. Those are intimate samples. Mm. This was an intimate sample. It was in her panties. I spent the rest of the time trying to figure out whose DNA this was. We had a database of almost anybody that had anything to do with the case that would give us their DNA. We had their DNA. There was one individual that was reluctant to give us their DNA. Well, we'd serve him with a grand jury subpoena, show up and give us your DNA. And he gave us his DNA. So we had all of the suspects, all of the family members. We had uh, people that were married into the family. We had anybody that we could possibly imagine who could have left this DNA and we knew about, we got their DNA and we had it and it didn't match anybody. What we were lucky enough that it was a partial profile, but it was enough of a profile that it could be entered into the CODIS database. Mm -hmm. Your listeners probably know what that is, but that's the national DNA database that ties cases together. Even though you might not know who did it, you may have eight rapes where DNA was left. It's the same DNA. It will tie them together and it does it nationally. Then it connects you with convicted felons or convicted people or arrestees, depending on the state laws that are in the database. So guys that are in prison, guys that are on probation for felonies, it will hook you up with those people and you know it's their DNA. And that's how CODIS works. And it has been running in CODIS since we put it in, I think it was 25, almost 30 years ago. And it has never matched anybody in CODIS and it has never matched another case that's in CODIS. There are over 17 million people in CODIS. I was going to ask that. And there were over a million samples Mm -hmm. from crime scenes in CODIS. And it has never matched anybody in CODIS. And it continues to this day to run constantly. It's not something that you have to trigger. Mm -hmm. It runs and it's comparing all the time. So as people are being added to that database, maybe someday there will be a CODIS, what they call a CODIS hit. 